Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Independent Speculator Interviews. Our guest or victim today is Paul Cowley of formerly Cornerstone Metals, now First Vanadium Corp. And as uh, you know, longtime readers and viewers know, I am a vanadium bull. It's a very interesting metal. It's, it's the best performing metal this year. And here we have almost a pure play, vanadium play. So, Paul, why don't you tell us about your, your project, your company, and then we'll dive into Q&A. Certainly, thanks. Well, first off, thanks very much for the invitation, Lobo. It's great to be able to reach out to, to your membership and to uh, our shareholders and, and potential investors uh, in a different format. This is And this is a great one. Well, thank, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. So I'll just tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, and so First Vanadium uh, has one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, primary vanadium deposit in North America because of its richness and size. So it's a really significant deposit, um, and is, it's gaining a lot of momentum in the in the marketplace. But first, I uh, might mention to people that are new to vanadium that vanadium is is a mineral that's critical and strategic. Um, principally for uh, strengthening steel. So for rebar, structural steel, for infrastructure, bridges, high rises, things like that, even in, in, in uh, chassis of cars to make them lighter and stronger. Uh, but, and that's about 90% of the vanadium that goes uh, in, that it gets consumed. Then there's about 10% that goes into these batteries and, and vanadium is this ideal battery for storing large amounts of electricity. Uh, and and what's really, really cool right now is we're in a, a cycle that's uh, um, very enviable. Me metal prices of vanadium have gone from under $3 to over $22 US a pound in less than three years. And it's reflecting the, this high demand, but a shortage of vanadium around the world. Um, there's also uh, no vanadium uh, producers in North America or, or the United States, which makes this a very attractive project. And it also makes the U.S. nervous that they don't have a supply line of, of vanadium to their domestic uh, steel or, or battery um, manufacturers. Um, and so they've gone through a process uh, to the regulators to uh, um, streamline the permitting process for particularly projects that are of critical or strategic uh, metals, which, which is what vanadium is and which our project is. So we're in a, a very enviable position to uh, be working this project during a, 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 um, a boom to vanadium prices, but uh, a sustainable one, we believe, and all the forecasts that we've seen from uh, researchers are that um, this high demand, low supply line of vanadium is gonna last for five to 10 years, if not more. It's a very unique metal, metal uh, and so it has a lot of very, very good features. So now we, 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 we're very fortunate to have this very significant deposit uh, of vanadium in the US near uh, the town of Carlin or, or Elko in north central Nevada, which is, uh, is one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world. The infrastructure is amazing uh, with all the gold development or, and, and um, permitting, or sorry, the pr production of gold in the Carlin Trend has just developed this fantastic infrastructure. There's two rail lines that uh, that go into Carlin. We're six miles away from Carlin, which is a railhead that goes to both both coasts. Uh, we're we're on on road, six miles by road to Carlin. Um, the towns of Carlin and Nevada and um, and Elko are are mining uh, mining based communities, and they've got. So uh, workforce, the skilled labor force, uh, professionals, uh, vendors, uh, service providers for the mining sector. So great infrastructure. And then we've got this deposit that uh, has some fantastic features um, that it's near surface, uh, that it's uh, shallow dipping to flat dipping. Uh, so um, we're, we're, our stripping ratio is expected to be less than two to one, which is a, a, an amazing feature. So costs for mining, we expect to be very low. Um, the, um, it's very high metallurgy, or very high grades of vanadium. Um, uh, right now, there's a historic resource of uh, 28 million tons of uh, 0.53, but that's gonna change uh, by the time we've done two drill programs, and um, which 
we expect then, I mean, and I just finished uh, completing the second drill program of uh, 69 holes. This is now uh, beginning of October. Um, so we're expecting a new resource calculation to come out in, in uh, November, probably later November. Uh, and then because of um, the economics look very good from us internally, we're, we're, we're deciding to push, uh, uh, skip the PEA level and go right to a pre-feasibility, which we're moving very, very quickly and aggressively because of all these things that are falling into place. We're hitting, hitting great milestones and exceeding expectations. So we're, we're on a really, really good, um, really good uh, path. And, and, and this is only, we, we acquired this property in November of last year. So in under a year, we're making some great headway and our stock price is, is performing very well as a result. Hard, hard to. Hard, there's so many great things I'd like to tell you about it, but it, yeah, maybe maybe I'll leave it with you to direct any any questions that you have there, Obo. Sure. Uh, so great overview, and thanks for doing a little bit of the introduction on the vanadium part of the story because it is a new story to a lot of people who've never really paid attention to vanadium vanadium as a commodity before. Uh, I'll appreciate it. So. You know, I, I get the basic story. We have a North American deposit. We have something that looks maybe economic near surface. It's big uh, and all, all happy, happy, joy, joy. And your share price has certainly showed that. It was, uh, in fact, your, your stock was the last one I recommended in my former employment before I left. And it doubled almost immediately. and was a triple not long <laughs> thereafter. <laughs> Um, I do not own the stock today, and I'm still thinking about it, and maybe some of the questions we'll ask now will help me make a decision. Um, the, the first one that comes to mind is really, you know, with all uh, big bulk tonnage projects, it's all about the margins of the various things, you know, the strip ratio that you mentioned, and the metallurgy and so on. So can you talk to us about that? As I understand it, this is a pretty flat-lying deposit, and it's relatively near surface. Uh, but it's not terribly thick. It's not something that goes down hundreds of meters. It's it's Whoa. tens of meters thick. Um, right. So thirty, so 30 it, you know, to fifty meters thick. Which thirty is, to fifty yeah. meters thick. So if it's if it's thirty to fifty meters thick, but it's sixty meters below surface, you know that's and a ton of rock to get to every ton of of waste. And and yeah. can you can you address that? Is that a concern at all? That uh, no, you know, it doesn't outcrop, right? If there isn't a Pardon? it doesn't outcrop. Right. There's no it starter does. pit. It does. Uh, oh, it does. Yes, it, okay. Yeah. Well, it, does outcrop. it comes right to surface. Our, some of our drill holes are start right in mineralization, right from surface. Well, that's yeah, good to know. That that wasn't clear to me from looking at the maps and sections that I've seen. So, yeah. there. So there is a starter pit area then. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And this is uh, this is not only you've spoke about the thickness, but also over a strike length. So so the. Like the, if you look down on it, uh, like the aerial view of it, the other dimensions are about two kilometers uh, in the in the north south direction, and about three quarters of a kilometer in the east. Sorry, in the north south direction is two kilometers, and about three quarters of a kilometer in the east west direction. So then that plus times the thickness gives you this very sizable millions of tons of deposit. Right. So, okay. So. Yes, um, I hadn't realized that it daylighted in part. So it, it varies then in the strip ratio and the average. Is that a published number I saw in the presentation? It was a, like a one well, to one. We, yeah, it's it's something that we're working on right now with with the engineering group. Um, so there's it would average uh, about two to one waste to ore. Um, there's obviously places where it's right at surface. So that's a zero strip ratio. And other places where it's you know two and a half. So, on average, we're just making it uh, talking about it until we actually get a mine plan, and that mine plan would would come out in uh, a pre-feasibility study. So <clears throat> right now we're just giving general general numbers. Okay. All right, but this, okay. So still, that's that's still overall a, a pretty low strip ratio as these things yeah. go. Um, I was a little, well, little, yeah. little concerned about the this overburden or over uh, the coverage versus the thickness yeah. of the thing. But if overall maybe two to one is as bad as it gets, that's still not too bad. And of yeah, course, well, what yeah. you strip, you don't have to process. So it's it's a mistake some people do to to, to try to adjust the grade by just the strip ratio. So I, I understand that. 
I also noticed that there's a higher grade component to the deposit, but I, I didn't see like a cartoon that shows a higher grade corridor or layer or something. Can you talk about that? Is it a layer or is it, is it just areas? Yeah. Is it spotty or is there a... Well, that's a good, good question. Yeah. So the way we, uh, there's, and, and this, this drill program that we just completed where we did 69 holes is really adding a lot of understanding to the geology. So um, we're, we're uh, what we're seeing is a, is is within a, a black shale unit, there is a subunit that's this high grade layer or or um, zone that's the 30 to 50 meters thick, um, and it's it's very very continuous uh, with with natural variations which you you'd only see but it, you know from the bigger scope bigger scale it's it's very continuous as a single as a single bed, so to speak, within that shale sequence. There are other zones that are l lower grade that are above and below this in that same shale sequence. So you have you have uh, zones that are you know 10 to 15 meters of between 0.25 and 4% and 0.4%. And so you know in terms of of stripping, you would end up having to strip some of that stuff that does have grade before you get to the high grade. And you'd either stockpile that uh, and process at some, some point or blend it. Um, you know, that's, that's what the engineers have to decide in the process. So, so it is, yes, it is a, a bed within a shale sequence. And it's only, as I said, it's close, it exposes it to surface and, and only as deep as 60 meters below surface. So it's, that's the, so it's a very attractive looking thing. Uh, another thing to mention too is uh, th that rock that hosts the, uh, that, that shale rock that hosts that high grade vanadium band or bed is quite broken. Uh, and so it's, I would say it's like 80% of it is actually, you know, broken rock. So we're not, that adds to, or uh, um, to the benefit of it, of there's going to be a low, um, a lower mining cost because there's going to be less explosive used potentially in areas we can use rippers and not you know explosives and, and traditional hard hard rock this is going to be quite easy you can use strip or uh, rippers and scrapers in much of the deposit too is what we're anticipating and then and then the grinding the grinding is also very it's a soft rock because it's how you know it's already broken um and it's a shale, so it's it's very soft to, to grind too. So there's those are all added benefits of lowering the cost, the operating costs. All right. And before we move on from that, when you do publish your new resource, will we be able to see the block model with the different grades and layers? And you know, maybe that'll help us to uh, understand yeah. how the high grade holds together. Yeah, I, I would anticipate that in the 43101 report that would follow. So we would, as as you expect. There's a 43101 uh, number that comes out that we would announce, and then 45 days after that, the independent engineering firm need to provide a, a backup report. And in that report would be figures that that support that. Now we can consider um, maybe in in the news release to see if the engineering firm would would allow us to put that in with the with the resource, because obviously for them to make that. Uh, resource block model, they would need to have all that work done anyway. So yeah, right. That's a that's a good that's a good point. Um, it would help people see because when if you uh, followed our drilling that we did in in the springtime when we did twenty diamond drill holes, we uh, did a good strike length test in between existing holes that Union Carbide had done and uh, followed along the spine of the, of the good grade and, and we were getting very good solid grades. So there are areas that are sort of, um, uh, 0.8 to 1% or even one and a half percent, uh, V205 in, in there, um, along that corridor. So, and so if you visit our website, you'll see kind of the results of our, of our diamond drilling that we did in, in January, February. That report uh, these grades in in tables and and you shows it in comparison with nearby Union Carbide holes. Right. Yeah. And that's really the reason why I bring it up because 
for anybody that has looked at the space, Largo is the company that sort of comes to mind as the comparable, and their average grade is over a percent. So then anybody else comes along with a fraction of a percent, and then you, you got to wonder, is this going to work? How's it going to work? And therefore, my question's about the orientation and the consistency in the strip ratio. And the, the other one along those lines would be the metallurgy. You've published some preliminary testing that shows very yeah. high recoveries in excess of 95%. And can you talk to us, you know, what scale it is, what kind of tests those are? Is this just some guy in a lab with a test tube somewhere oh. saying we got, or is it a, is, you know, is it a bulk or, or how, how good are those numbers and how likely are they to change? Okay, so yeah, so first off, the uh, question of who, who's doing it. So it's a, in, in unison with our team of metallurgists, we've got a number of brilliant metallurgists in our, in our network, um, uh, four or five, and we're working with Sherit uh, Technologies in, in Northern Saskatchewan who are doing the lab work. They, they're, they're brilliant, successful people in, in, um, in this field of, of test work. So we're collaborating with ideas and sharing the ideas and testing. So we've done a number of tests um, and we're getting, you know, consistently high results. And I should mention it's what we've published is between 80 and 95 percent extraction into solution. So it's not recovery yet, but it's that's that's an important uh, distinction. But we're not anticipating that there's other parts of the of the flow sheet that we're defining. So so I didn't, let me come back. Um, so there's we've done 15 uh, tests that are that are testing uh, various parameters uh, that uh, from using a roaster, not using a roaster, using an autoclave, not using an autoclave, doing a, an acid um, leach and doing light versions of each of those. So those are, that's the, the working sort of uh, platform that we're working on. And we're finding that there's, and we published up to 95% in that, in one of the, one of the tests, one of those tests. Uh, we're finding actually we get 95 percent, 90 to 96 percent in a variety of of um, components. So it's not just roaster. It's we can get it if we use a pure autoclave. Um, so th those are things that it's a work a work in progress, um, um, and it's that front end that we've we've kind of reported preliminary results on. Uh, we're we're still going through that. We're getting closer to defining a. A flow, a flow sheet is what metallurgists uh, talk about that locks down the process. Um, we're working on the back end where once we get vanadium into the solution, you have to get it out of solution and into a, a solid form that's a product that you can sell. And we're not anticipating any problems with that. The main, probably the most significant aspect is to, to be able to extract the vanadium into solution. Once you get into solution, it's not that much of a problem. There's uh, you know, standard sort of steps. So that's where we are right now, and so we're 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 still working through combinations of these um, components to get the best recovery for the least operating and capital costs. So, yes, we've, we've said that we can get 95% recovery or not re, uh, extraction, um, and so it's it's finding that balance of cost versus benefit. Uh, which is an engineering process, and we're we're in that process right now. And I say we're not anticipating it. It'll be, um, uh, you know, in terms of of where we're headed with it. I would say, obviously, but we're we're between 80 and 95 percent in terms of what we're anticipating those recoveries to be. But uh, that is yet to be formalized and through good engineering studies. Okay, understood. And I appreciate your, your forthright clarification there. That's something to look forward to. And I guess the time frame, given that you're working on this PFS, is you expect to have these answers, what, by the end of the year? So we're, we're not actually starting the PSFS yet. Um, we're, we're, we will need the re new resource calculation, which we, from this drilling and from our previous drilling, combine all that, remodel uh, model it, um, and so I would think that probably the last two weeks of November, um, it's it, it, to get a resource number. It, that's that's our our target, uh, but we're we are being held up because the labs are chock a block uh, from samples, not only our own but everyone in, has got stuff in, in the labs, and so that's slowing down the process. Unfortunately, it's not not to do with anything about the project. It's just just the state that we're in in terms of. Uh, 
lots of exploration everywhere in gold and copper and everywhere else um, and lithium. So um, if if we do get the all the, these all of our samples done by um, late October or early November, we should because we can we can do a lot between that time um, in terms of our modeling. We anticipate still right the end of the last two weeks of November to have the resource calculation. Once we have that, that's the basis um, or a significant basis for uh, a, a, a pre-feasibility. Um, and and but but what's really an advantage is our engineering group, uh, our advisors, are are working with an engineering firm right now. So we're already starting to work through a lot of anticipated uh, studies so that um, that'll that'll shorten the the period of uh, the length of the uh, the pre fees right now we're we're uh, um, thinking that before the end of the year or early next year is when we would actually fit, uh, formally start the pre pre fees um, and as I say it's probably shorter than most pre fees because we're doing a lot of footwork right now so it'll be mid next year for those numbers to come out. But I wasn't asking about the timing of the pre-feasibility study. I was t asking about the timing of the MET test, which you don't oh, need the, the, the model for that. Um, um, that's a little bit still uh, hard to guess. I'm thinking um, two to three, maybe as much as four months. It depends. We're trying, we're still trying various things that can continue to optimize and get the best um, lowest cost, best best recovery. So uh, we don't want to rush that because obviously it's like the you want to have the the right combination of of costs. You know, reporting anything early is detrimental because it's it's a work in progress, and that's why unfortunately I know there's a, it's a question that a lot of investors have is like, well, you've reported in Fe in in July, and so what's going on? Why aren't we getting more? It's, it's a necessary step and there's patience that have to be done. We're not anticipating any problems. We're just getting it done well. So unfortunately, that's the best I can say right now. And I've given you a, some, some like a, uh, the, the landscape of where we are with it um, behind the scenes, yeah. But okay, but still, if you're gonna start the, the PFS, hopefully by the, start that by the end of the year and have it out by halfway through next year, then that would be an outside limit for your MET test. I mean, you have to have those done before you yeah. can have the, That's right. <laughs> the PFS done. Okay, exactly. um, and all of this gets down to margins, right? And, and uh, you know, they, people like to say grade is king, but I like to say, no, no, margin is king. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see. And I, I don't think we need to flog the other advantages. You did a good job covering them. You're right off the highway. You're right near towns and miners and, and a pro mining oh, jurisdiction. We get all that, so that's why you know I may be a little bit technical here, but that's why I was trying to ask about the, you know, the actual key variables that would go into mining and processing this, because that's what's yeah. going to determine our margins. Um, so in terms of deliverables, then we've got this resource which is coming up soon, based on the just completed drilling, and then next year we've got the PFS, we've got these, you know, very important metallurgical test work. Are we going to get back to drilling while this is ongoing, or what other deliverables are we looking for in the quarters ahead? Well, uh, yeah, the next month and a half, the drill results uh, will be coming out from this uh, this past the second campaign. Basically, we we wanted to make sure with this second campaign that we got everything that we need to get um, um, that because we wanted to get as much value added. To be put into this pre fees. We wanted to make sure that any wide spacing that was in the deposit got filled in so that we get as much um, indicated category of resources and not and as little inferred resources as possible. So we did a lot. We, we probably did about 30 holes that were in the guts of the deposit to make sure that we had really, really good coverage. So we're anticipating um, a lot of indicated. Which is all, all measured and indicator are the only resources that can go into the pre fees. Um, and we also did about 30 some odd holes, uh, these are kind of rough numbers, on the edges to grow the deposit bigger than what Union Carbide had laid out. And, and we did that in, a, in, again, 40 meter centers so that 
we didn't do a lot of wide space drilling to kind of um, generate a bunch of uh, uh, uncertain resources they, they, they inferred. Um, so we're anticipating a really, really solid, um, high quality resource number uh, with lots of uh, indicated. So we're not anticipating going back to drilling again. Um, that having said that, the only time that we would consider doing that was maybe with uh, if the engineering firms, and I, and I don't think we'll need it for the pre-fees, but between pre-fees and feasibility, there might be a requirement to do some geotechnical drilling. But that's, that's uh, late 2019 probably. Be looking to do that. So, so so the deliverables then pretty much are the well immediately the drill results, yes. and and then the resource, yes. and then engineering study results, and then the pre feasibility, and that's probably right. as far as ahead as we need to look. And right. how much will all of that cost, and how much do you have in the bank? These are the two questions I always ask everybody. <laughs> okay, it sounds good. How much is yeah. it going to cost, and how much do you have? Yeah. No. So we we've been in a really really good space here uh, we have about 2.5 million dollars left in our in our treasury and that's because we've had a, uh, we've we've got warrants that um, are all in the money from our october and our march uh, financings uh, which are at 24 cents and 45 cents and our stock is now at dollar 60 so those warrant holders are exercising so there is replenishing of our of our treasury which is very very comfortable. So we we have about, as I say, about two and a half million dollars in our treasury right now. Um, we have about three million dollars um, that we anticipate to get from those warrants, which gives us a very comfortable um, position. We don't need to go to the market to do another financing for a year plus. Um, and, and now to the budget, we um, this drill program is probably going to cost about half a million dollars. Um, the me further metallurgical work will do another maybe $250,000 worth of work. Um, we're doing environmental um, studies, uh, cultural studies, of, like um, archaeology. That'll be another $250,000 um, to get us uh, a deliverable document for new permit, for larger scale permitting, or, uh, disturbance on the, on the site. So about a million dollars basically um uh and the and the psf uh the pre fees we're anticipating it to cost us maybe five hundred thousand dollars six hundred thousand dollars not not a heck of a lot because we're doing a lot up front ourselves with our own own people that we can pass on and and the engineering firms can can vet so um even after the pre fees we're going to have money left over and then there's warrant money that can still top up the treasury so we're in a very, very healthy, and we're very important. We, we've, we've made um, careful uh, consideration to managing our share structure very, very well. We've got 35 million shares out, outstanding, uh, which is a really en enviable position. Um, and we're wanting to make sure that we are careful with that share structure, that, that we can use this share structure to be able to finance the project eventually. We, you know, moving that's much further down the line, but we'll have money to be able to to do a pre feasibility. Uh, feasibility. We have money to you know to carry the project further on. Um, so it's uh, yeah, we're in a very good space. That's that's an interesting sure. point. Let me let me ask about that last point. Um, when I think of big bulk tonnage projects, I usually think this is something a major producer needs to build. Now, sometimes, especially if there's a starter area, you can get going with a modest amount of capital and sort of bootstrap yourself up. I know this is very early. We don't even have a, a 43-101 resource yet. But conceptually, no. do you think this is a project that uh, a junior could ultimately build? I mean, you already know it's big, right? Yeah. So is this a project that a junior could realistically build? Or, or are we talking about billions and dollars of uh, initial capital that is really you know, going to take well. a bigger company to pull together? Um, we're anticipating, we, we have a, a very, very good net, uh, uh, team of uh, professional engineers and geologists. So we've got the, we and, and within that group, their network. So we do have the people skills, uh, the, the technical skills to pull it off, which most companies 
most junior companies only have a, a, a portion of that of that knowledge base and skill base. Very different. Yeah, exactly. And even construction is very different from operating. So we've got, we've got. I'm the explorer. Um, been successful with major companies with with fines and 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 advancing projects. We've got a construction engineer who's uh, building um, Lundin's mine in Ecuador right now. He's built about 20 mines uh, in North and South America. We've got operating engineers, mining engineers, as well as processing engineers. So we've got, and these are all senior people that have worked with major companies, had successes with major companies. So we do have, and, and of course, those fellows have the networks that they'll pull in. So we do have this amazing kind of network um, that is exceptional for a junior company. And as I mentioned earlier, we were being careful with our share structure that um, we believe there's going to be continued value added. So our anticipated a share price to be, be to be rising and, and be able to raise more money. So the five to 10 million, the next raise would probably be five to $10 million, uh, hopefully at a, at a higher price. And so even at that, it's still uh, uh, um, a share structure that's very, very modest. Um, and then taking it to the next level, uh, we, you know, we believe that we'll have um, partners that will come in to align with us and see the value there and want to get, want to participate. So there's, we think that we can, we can actually take it all the way. Having said that, there's also, you know, if, if, a, if a group sees after the pre-feasibility numbers come out and there's an attractive number there, um, Somebody could make an attractive offer that we would have to uh, consider and and put to the shareholders to consider. But that's so it, I suppose that that's that's two different exit strategies that are available to us. But it's not yeah you know, we're not hon or not stuck in one only. Very good answers. Um, so on behalf of readers I know who are shareholders, I would say I strongly encourage you if you have. Um, you know, there should be shareholder rights protection provisions in place. If there aren't, you know, the poison pill or something, there should be something there to try to protect the interests of shareholders. And to the degree possible, I mean, at, at, at some price, everything's for sale, of course. Uh, yeah. But we like exits that give us uh, shares in the takeover. If we believe in your project, if we believe in the value that you're uncovering, and somebody comes along with a cash offer, and yes, it offers a premium now, but it cuts off the upside. So it, it's it's always nice if we can you know get an offer for share for shares for as shareholders. So I know you know all this, but I'm just throwing it out there. To, to whatever degree you have wiggling room, negotiating room in here, I'm sure your shareholders would appreciate it if they knew and felt that you were looking out for their interest on that going forward. Yeah, absolutely. That, those are very good points. Yeah. Okie doke. Um, well, we've already gone a half an hour here, so I don't want to take too much more of your time. But I did mm -hmm. want to pull back and, and look at the big picture a bit. Uh, vanadium is a great story, but it's also a pretty small niche market. And most of the vanadium produced today is produced as a byproduct. So you can have external factors come in. If, if the byproduct production goes up, then you could have a lot more vanadium come on the market, whether people want it or not. Or it's small enough a market that you know a, a very large you know, vanadium focused play could come in and really alter the supply and demand imbalance. Now, have you looked at that and do you have any sense for how entrenched the supply deficit, and I, and I get that vanadium is in a supply deficit right now, it's why we're having this conversation. Uh, how solid is that and can it last and is there a risk of some, you know, big swing player coming in here and altering that? Well, um, the readings that I've done is it, 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 we're anticipating uh, just with the steel side, which obviously is the biggest consumer of it, of vanadium, we're anticipating at least three and a half percent. And this is these are numbers from other other groups, not not from us. Three and a half percent increased demands of vanadium compounded. Um, there's there's really limited production coming from various sources like Largo Resources. Uh, in Brazil and then China and Russia and South Africa, so there obviously there's an opportunity for them to increase their their production rate, which Largo has indicated that they're going to do that. Um, there's other projects that are obviously vying for uh, timing and position 
to you know uh, take advantage of this market, which is only natural market forces. Uh, and I we recognize that there's some some good ones in 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 particular. I like there's some good ones in Australia that I would um, that are are serious ones. Um, other ones in North America, I don't know. It's it's I don't want to um, get too far off on that, but there's there are uh, that's only a natural process of of market playing, um, not market playing, but market um, response. Um, there are some projects that are kind of on the books, but a lot of them are this one Australian that I a project is is within sort of the one to two year range of production, but all the other ones are probably three to five years away. So, and even if with that kind of timeline and the size that they could uh, input to the to the, su the supply, that increase of demand is is just going to be gobbled up. It, it'll it'll uh, we believe that with that three and a half percent increase of demand every year, as projects come in, they'll just it'll just get absorbed, and so we don't see necessarily a big drop in metal price because of new projects coming on. Uh, there, there is a long lead time for these projects to come along. Um, so, and then the, then there's the the aspect of the the um, the battery side, which is very very interesting. Uh, it, it, the, these commercial uh, industrial sized batteries are now being commercialized. They're being in, uh, installed into power companies, grids, and and um, solar and wind farms. So, as those prove themselves, um, they are going to be those are just going to multiply, which will add more and more demand to vanadium. So we see, and other people have written about this, is that there's, at least for 10 years, there's going to be, a, um, there's going to be more demand than supply coming in. And, um, and so that's a good, it's a good place to be. <laughs> well, one final point on that. Since most of the demand is still in the, in the steel consumption yeah. um, and the alloying, um, and that China is such a big player there. If the tariff conflict continues and if that really hits the Chinese hard and they sort of tighten the sphincters there, could that in the short term actually put a, a, a dent in vanadium prices? I think on, on the contrary, it'll, it'll just uh, add more pressure here. Uh, well, you know, it, 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 as another example, um, you know, it, just in a recent article, there's three cities. Let me just come back. Infrastructure is very, very important. And we've got areas in China, well, China and Russia are, are have plans on trillions of dollars of spending in infrastructure, trillions, and as well as in the U.S. So just with regular kind of global growth. Sorry, let me jump in there to clarify. And that's government spending, right? It's, it's, it's you that's know, right. roads and buildings and yeah. things. So it kind of almost doesn't matter whether the economy slows down because it's government spending, not private sector spending. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So there's trillions of dollars on the on the planning for infrastructure for Russia, China and the US. That's going to add further demands uh, to vanadium. Another example, um, just the first of November, November is when a law takes into effect in China that the Chinese rebar manufacturers have to put 30 percent more vanadium in their rebar. That's something that, and that's what's spawning some very, very um, volatile or high prices of vanadium right now. We're hearing that it, you know, prices are jumping from 22 to close to $30 a, a pound because of responding to that, that kind of shortfall. Another example in China is there's three, currently three cities that have subway systems that are being installed hmm. that are going to consume 80 80 million tons, 80, 80, no, about 10% uh, of the world's demand, uh, annual demand of, of vanadium. So that's just one little thing that's adding to it, including all the rebar. And, and so it's just a very, very um, high demand. Um, things are, are just, we believe it's just heating up for vanadium um, with all of this, all, all of these projects that are going on in China and Russia and the U.S. 
Um, not not to not to mention, you know, there's military benefits uh, to vanadium because it makes um, steel harder and and, and um, a lighter weight. So there's m military potential or uses of vanadium too. So okay, all right. Well, those are those are good answers uh, yeah. addressing our our concerns here. Um, you know, congratulations on the excellent work on the ground. We look forward to the new numbers as they're released. And thank you for taking the time to uh, answer our questions today. My pleasure, Lobo, and, and uh, I'd love to have you down to the project to show you around too at some point in time. It's on the to-do list. We'll, we'll definitely have to get out and have a look. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you again. Yep. All right, all the best.